Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes. I share my screen kindly. Sure, sure, you can share. <coughs> yeah, we see it. Thank you, sir. <coughs> uh, so, thanks once again, Samarik. <coughs> Uh, let me start a uh, simple question, please. Uh, with your permission, I want to put up this question in front of you. Uh, the question is, uh, what's the main business of a business? So I'll, I'll appreciate your input, please. Uh, welcome. Yes, so a question again is, uh, what What's the main business of a business? Main business of a business. Efficiently increase the wealth of a business or, or equity or whatever you call it. Okay, yes. it means to earn more profit. Yes. That's, that's one, one option. Anything else? I, desired objective. Uh, it's uh, you, uh, main, can I, uh, it's uh, mainly to serve humanity. On the top. Uh, to serve humanity, correct? Uh, to serve humanity, uh, provide customer services. Anything else, please? You know, uh, I think uh, basically it gives you the power to get into any kind of venture. I mean, if you have uh, the right kind of business, then venturism is your hobby. Uh, Means uh, to flourish. So once we flourish, we earn more money. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's it. So That's it. Yes. Is money. yes. Not not necessarily money, but the main objective would, for what you business could be the uh, welfare oriented also. Yeah, we are talking about uh, for profit organizations. We are not talking for uh, about non profit organizations. But of all, even non profit organizations. Work on money, very money. frankly. Kuch kar lo, wo intentions aapki noble ho sakti hain, but aapko tools chahiye. Whether money or anything, human resource, there's so many things. You True. have to have that. Agar human True. resource bhi lani hai, paisa chahiye. Right. So economics is the main issue. Uh, correct. Uh, thanks for your input. In my case, koi bhi answer galat nahi hai. Uh, but the right answer is just a second. The, the main business of a business is to stay alive. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, whatever we have said, uh, it's not possible if organization they cease to exist. <clears throat> so the first and most important job for any organization is to staying alive, to survive. Mm. So we'll take the same question and we'll try to apply it on an image. And the image is this one. <clears throat> so if I ask the same question again, what's the main business of these two folks based on the context given in this diagram? So let's pick the main guy first, which is the bigger one, the loin. What's the main business of loin? To stay alive. To stay alive. And how she can stay alive based on this context? By consuming the deer. Yeah, so mm -hmm. if she's able to catch gazelle, correct? So mm -hmm. how can she catch gazelle? Provided she runs faster than the gazelle. That's the requirement. Mm -hmm. right? So yes. if we move on to gazelle now, uh, what's the main business of gazelle? To live again, to stay alive. again to stay alive. So how can she stay alive based on this scenario? By running faster than the lion. Thank you. By running faster than the lion or at least running faster than the other gazelle. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> right. So <laughs> this is the quotation I came across uh, concerning uh, this image. Uh, once I was writing my dissertation, it, show, it, sh it says, uh, when the gazelle wakes up in the morning, it knows that it has to run faster than the lion, otherwise it will be eaten. When the lion wakes up in the morning, it knows 
that it has to run faster than the gazelle, otherwise it will starve. It's morning, start running. Does it make any sense? <laughs> okay, so let's make some modification to this uh, statement. Uh, let's replace uh, gazelle with organization A and lion with organization B. Please reread this and let me know if it does not make any sense. It still makes sense. Thank you. And I think we can further go and modify this statement. We can replace organization A with team A organization B with team B or individual A and B or political party A and B or country A and B. It would apply to all those standards. So in nutshell, what organizations are doing nowadays is they all are running. There are two types of these organizations. One type, uh, they want to run faster just to make sure that they catch those organizations who, who are ahead of them so that they can grab their market share. And the other type is those organizations who are, who are already ahead, they want to further run faster so that the gap between them and whosoever is following them should not decrease. <clears throat> so, to keep up with this space, what organizations have done so far, because we have understood from this that yes, uh, to survive organizations, they have to improve, they have to transform on a daily basis, just to make sure that they stay alive. And once they are staying alive, they can earn more money, they can serve their community, they can serve their customers. So to keep up with the pace, what did organizations do? Uh, we'll go back to 1920 or 30, I guess. Uh, most of us have read about Shuhart's PDCA cycle, which just stands for Plan, Do, Check, and Act. It's a simple tool, but even if we look any modern methodology in today's world, uh, for example, project management, Lean Six Sigma, uh, business process reengineering, uh, change management, uh, PDCA is their foundation as well. So companies started following uh, PDCA principles. <clears> then <throat> Dr. Shuhart's uh, a student, uh, Dr. Demings, he introduced, he made some changes to PDCA. He replaced C with S. Uh, that makes sense that it should be study not only to check. A uh, few more uh, tools known as SPC, SQ, C were introduced. Then we all know about uh, Ford's assembly line concept. Then I think back in 1960s, uh, uh, Japanese automobile industry's quality was too low, whereas the US automobile industry quality was high. So Toyota executives, they visited force plant, understood how they are delivering that kind of quality. They went back and they added a few more tools to the system which they studied. And they came up with a system known as TPS, uh, uh, Toyota Production System. And then Gold Rat, he wrote a book, uh, The Goal, which was focused on that uh, no matter how efficient an organization is, uh, they will have at least one weak link in it. So organizations, they need to identify those weak links and improve those. Uh, another book was written, um, I think in 1988, known as 20 Keys. This was mainly focused on the learning from Toyota production system. So they came up with uh, 20 keys that can help organization to improve on daily basis. Uh, we all have heard about uh, another term known as Six Sigma. Uh, back in late 80s, uh, Matrola, they came up uh, with this concept that they are, if, if they are able to produce uh, no more than 3.4 defects per million opportunity, they can beat their Japanese uh, competitor. So that was the Six Sigma methodology. 
then U.S. automobile industry, they had issues uh, in 70s with their quality. And on the other hand, uh, Japanese automobile industry, their quality was skyrocketing. So they hired a few professors from MIT who uh, visited Japan toward Toyota's plan, uh, understood how they are delivering that kind of quality. Once they came back, they wrote this book, uh, The Machine That Changed the World. Uh, it's said that this is the most read book in the corporate world. I think it has been uh, translated into 11 languages. So what they wrote in this book was about the system Toyota uh, is using, but instead of writing TPS, they introduced a new name known as Lean. Well, what happened in 1982, Harvard Business Review, they came up with another concept known as the business, uh, sorry, uh, balance scorecard. That means that company should not be evaluated only based on its uh, financial performance, but we need to look into their customer satisfaction score, uh, employees learning and the process maturity. <clears throat> uh, we have heard about the Curtis Lewin uh, change uh, management model, uh, which was, uh, I, uh, refreeze, uh, move, and then sort of which is defreeze, move, and refreeze. So based on the same model, then a few practitioners, they came up with different kind of organizational change management uh, principles. And few have labeled those as organization development as well. Now, once we jump to IT industry, uh, then IT came up with their own name known as I tell. <clears throat> we also know uh, uh, so 9,000 uh, models. Plus, once we summarize all of this, nowadays organizations are focused on organization excellence. The main purpose of this slide was just to give you an idea that uh, as organizations, they want to improve what exactly they have done so far. So depending on these methodologies, uh, depending on their choice, who is marketing them, uh, which kind of methodology or which name they like. So different organization, they picked different methodologies out of list and started implementing it just to make sure that they improve. <clears throat> so once they implemented those, then obviously the next logical question is, uh, we need to understand what did they get? Uh, these are some of the numbers uh, which companies have reported initially once they started implementing Lean Six Sigma and process re-engineering uh, methodologies late in 80s and 90s. So we see General Electric saving over uh, 12 billion over the time period of five years, uh, Matrola 15 billion, Light Signal and Honeywell, and few more companies. Uh, but the question comes up, uh, how about the rest of the companies? Because if we look at North American market nowadays, I don't see any sector who is not implementing some of these methodologies currently. All organizations, they are busy somehow implementing uh, one out of these uh, few methodologies. So what were their, their results? Uh, studies have shown totally different results for majority of organizations, though only few were successful uh, initially. Others, considering the success rate of previous organizations, they thought that they can save or they can improve to that extent. Hence, they implemented it, but it's not that one size fits all. So they could not perform as well as these organizations have performed. So what's the result of uh, these uh, <clears throat> organizations who though are implementing these methodologies, but unfortunately they failed to achieve the success rate the other organization have achieved. So here are the few facts uh, which I want to share with you. Uh, more than 50% of change initiatives uh, by Fortune 500 companies are unsuccessful. 66% uh, of quality improvement tasks uh, fail in organizations. 70% of initiatives at Fortune 100 had, have never produced an improvement in bottom line results. 50% uh, of initiatives did not lead to an improvement in market share price. Uh, failure rates of organization-wide change efforts range from 66% to 75%. 
and all those of us who are uh, attached to uh, project management field, we know how projects uh, at different organizations uh, perform. Overall project performance, 40% uh, project fail to achieve their objectives. 70% of project fail even before we consider the technical issues. 60% 60, 60 projects do not do what they were supposed to do. 49% of projects suffer budget overruns, 41% project fail to deliver the expected business value and ROI. So this is just to share with you that though these methodologies are great companies, they have saved a lot, but majority of organization, they could not really reap the benefit which others have reaped. <clears throat> So that's the topic I have today. I'll discuss about uh, business transformation. And mainly I will touch on a few areas that why not all companies are able to reap the same benefits which few companies have here. Uh, the agenda is uh, simple. Uh, I've already provided uh, the background, which was that uh, why do we need a business transformation? Why companies need to improve. Uh, on next slide, uh, I'll introduce myself. Um, then I'll touch on what went wrong for those companies who could not benefit from these methodologies. <clears throat> and to understand what went wrong, we first need to understand that uh, how a typical organization currently works. And based on their current working style, what are the outcomes they are getting? Uh, then I'll briefly introduce uh, business transformation, that if we follow it uh, in a right spirit, what can be the results? And if any organization wants to start, on, start this journey, what should be the first step? And then I'll conclude this presentation. <clears throat> uh, we will fly at an altitude of 51,000 feet today. Any question on this, please? <laughs> Too high. You have oxygen on board? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the question is why. Uh, as we have seen, uh, business transformation is really a hybrid of many methodology. Uh, once we apply business transformation at any organization, a practitioner has to have a really a big toolkit with him or with her. And depending on the scenario, we take out appropriate tool and we apply it. So in this session, there's no way I can go through each and every tool or the sequence how transformation should be done. So I'll be staying at very high level just to give you an idea of business transformation and to share with you only a few things which I think companies are not following and that's the reason they are unable to improve. But if based on today's session, if there is uh, an interest, uh, if there is a requirement to know more about this topic, especially about the how part of it, then uh, we can schedule a more sessions where I can uh, explain the how part in detail. So that's the reason uh, for today we will be flying at a very high level. Just we'll be touching a few points here. Uh, my name is Ifsal. Uh, as Sir Slaudin introduced me, I'm from G30. Uh, this is uh, how I looked like two years ago. <laughs> so, uh, my first posting was at 17 uh, Squadron Flight Line. I worked under uh, Air Commodore, retired Raja Fees, then uh, moved to MRF, uh, Repair and Fabrication Wing. And my final posting before I uh, requested release from my PF was at uh, 105 AD. So this uh, makes me a certified Patu as well because I worked two and a half years at 105. <laughs> um, Landed in Canada um, uh, at a time was, there was no Twitter, no WhatsApp, uh, no Uber Eats, uh, no Netflix. So it was uh, not easy to get a good job. So mm -hmm. just like many, um, I delivered uh, pizza for a few months, uh, knocked doors, then 
unfortunately found a job. And since then, I'm, I have either directly or indirectly worked with uh, these companies. Uh, currently, I'm teaching uh, as a professor to postgraduate uh, students. So in addition to teaching, uh, I help uh, companies identify the right changes uh, and execute those. And that in return uh, would help companies uh, save costs, uh, improve customer satisfaction, and improve their uh, delivery timeline. So my few specialties are uh, Lean Six Sigma deployment, uh, training and certification, uh, and performance management and uh, uh, measurement. <clears throat> uh, I'm an aerospace engineer. Uh, after 10 years of my graduation, completed MBA, then I took another 12 years, then I completed my DBA. In addition, I have a few certifications uh, in quality management, uh, uh, project management, and a business transformation field. So coming back to, to the topic, uh, we were discussing that why different companies, uh, they were unable to achieve the same level of success as few companies did. So the question is, what went wrong? Uh, all those who understand accounting uh, principles, or I worked uh, uh, in accounting fields, uh, we know that there are two types of errors. Uh, error of commission and error of omission. Uh, error of commission is something that uh, an organization do, which they were not supposed to do. Means this uh, errors of actions, means we took wrong actions. And once we have taken the wrong actions, it's a short term side effects. So it affects the downside, but at the same time, it prevents the excellence, means it prevents the improvement which we could have made. On the other hand, Error of omission is uh, when an organization or individual, they fail to take an action which they should have taken. So basically it's the inaction. <clears throat> so they fail to take action that end up being a mistake afterwards. So if misses the upside and it's the long-term side effects. So if I may ask, uh, you a question that which out of these two do we regret most? If you look back to our lives, for example, so which action out of these two we regret most? The actions we took and those was not right are the actions we would have taken. Error of omission would be more severe. Oh, sorry, which one? Omission. Omission, omission means that we would regret those decisions that we thought we should take, but we did not. We failed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, as I understand, you're saying inaction. So inaction, yeah. I would say, is more severe rather than taking a wrong action. I mean, we That's right, sir. So it's the right correct. answer. Even same applies to organizations. <clears throat> yeah. So the deterioration and failure of organizations, or you can say teams or individuals, are almost always due to something they did not do. Uh, we have many examples in front of us. We know what BlackBerry was supposed to do, they didn't do it. We know what Blockbuster was supposed to do, they didn't do it. We know what Sears was supposed to do, they didn't do it. And so many. So to really understand these errors which organization are making before we go into that subject first we need to understand exactly that how a typically organization works so that will help us understand why they have these kind of issues <clears throat> so to illustrate that uh, working of a typical organization i'll use uh, uh, very familiar uh, diagram. Uh, this is the process, means it has a start and end. Uh, a start is a point once customer provides us some kind of uh, requirements. And the end part, part is once we deliver that product or service, the output to the customer. So to complete this uh, whole process, we do understand that we need some inputs uh, that would be processed within this box and an output would be delivered. 
So once I look at organization, I'm, and I'm talking about a bigger organization, uh, most of their executives or their senior leadership or their bosses, they are aware of what are the outputs of organization and they somehow may know what are the inputs they need or who is the vendor, vendor who is supplying those inputs. But what they don't know is that how these inputs are being provided, being transferred or being processed into the outputs. That's the reason I turned this box as the black box syndrome because it's totally really a black box for executives. And I'm saying this based on my experience. Because once we work with the senior leadership team uh, who have already developed a strategy and they want to execute it, uh, very few out of those would know that how those inputs are being processed and we are getting the output. <clears throat> but in this case, how do they engage uh, or how are they connected with the organization? Mm, I'm sure you all would agree that uh, most of the bosses, they are engaged once these organizations come up with some kind of problem. The moment a problem, problem comes out of this black box, what executive they do, they apply some kind of magic and they push those problems back to the same black box. So this is a typical uh, scenario of how organizations work in today's market. So what are the results of this kind of approach? Uh, there can be many effects of this approach, but I'll cover only two today. Uh, the first effect is on cost, means if we work this way, where management, they don't know how inputs are being processed and what exactly the output is. Uh, just to share with you, based on my studies with different organizations, many organizations, even they don't know that how much an output is costing them per, per unit. They may know how much, for how much they are selling it, but they don't know the actual cost. So what are the results? First one is it's a fact on the cost. So if we don't know deeper how things are being done, what are the effects on the cost? Uh, and we are talking about only operational cost. Uh, in um, business process engineering field or business transformation or Lean Six Sigma field, that cost has two types, known as cost of quality, which, another, which can be also said as preventive cost. And the second one is cost of poor quality, also known as reactive cost. Uh, preventive cost has further two subtypes. Prevention cost means cost incurred on all activities uh, which are proactive in nature and which are focused on improving quality that would go fall under prevention cost. And the cost incurred on making sure that whatever we are supposed to do, we have done it right. Means cost of inspection, auditing, or evaluation would fall under appraisal cost. Whereas cost incurred on any defect uh, identified internally and then fixed, uh, defects identified by customer, and then we are fixing those, means under scrap, rework, reinspection, or re that cost fall under reactive cost. So I'm presenting you these six numbers based on uh, GRAN Institute study. Uh, but before we map these six numbers to the type of these costs, I just want to go back to the definition of these three terminologies, just to make sure that uh, we all are on same uh, frequency. Uh, prevention cost. Costs incurred on all activities uh, we perform on planned proactive activities. Uh, for example, quality planning, quality uh, education and improvement projects. Appraisal costs, costs incurred on inspection activities. And the active cost is costs incurred on once we have to fix something. I have six numbers, but three terminologies. So I would request you to please uh, help me out to map these 
three numbers out of these six to these three terms. And the question is, based on wherever we work, uh, to, in whatever capacity, whatever industry, uh, based on the definitions which we have discussed, what do you think that currently a typical organization, what percentage of total cost they are spending on prevention cost? Currently, forget about what they are supposed to do. 20 to 25%. Uh, 25%. 20, 20 to 25. 20 to 25, either this or this. Okay, thank you. Any other input, please? I would say 10%. I would say 10%. 10%, sir, you are right, so it's 10%. <laughs> Water cooler up, <laughs> guys. <laughs> Thank you. So currently, again, we are discussing about 65 to 70 percent reactive cost. Yeah. So appraisal cost is 20 percent. Reactive cost is 70. So what it should be is this number that they should be spending only 10 percent on reactive cost, which is refixing things. 65% uh, on prevention activities and 25% on inspection activities. Now we can identify the difference ourselves. Uh, the cur it should be 65, here we have 10%. Uh, re reactive, it should be 10, but we have 70%. So if a company has 100 million operational costs, they are spending 70 million on reactive activities. So you can see the magnitude of the room of opportunity available in these organizations. Just to give you a hint, an idea that uh, how much uh, improvement opportunities we think we have in these typical organizations based on the work they are working on, based on the style they have now. So the second results I want to share with you is uh, facts on timeline. <clears throat> uh, we all know that uh, whatever work we do, uh, we have some kind of uh, processes to follow. Only then we'll be able to deliver whatever outcome our customer needs. And once we go deeper into a process, uh, we know that it has two types of activities. So a process is made up of two types of activity. One is known as value added activity. And the other one is obviously non-value added. Uh, non-value added has uh, further uh, two subparts, uh, business value add and waste. So to understand the definition of all these terms, we can only understand or uh, see what exactly value add means. So understanding this would clarify the other two as well. So to label any activity, whatever activity we perform in any kind of work, to label that activity as a value add, it has to fulfill this criteria. All three of these. Uh, the first one is that uh, stakeholder cares for it, or you can say the customer is willing to pay for that activity. Whatever we charge to our customer, if we have a breakdown and we include this activity in that charge, customer is willing to pay for it. Customer don't want us to ignore that activity. That's first. Second one, it is performed correctly the first time. There are so many, acti so many activities in a process, customer, they do care, they are willing to pay for it, but if we don't perform that correctly the first time and we are uh, spending time and we are repairing it, we are reinspecting it, that would no longer remain a value add. So the condition is it has to be performed correctly the first time. And the third one is it physically changes the product. What does that mean that you, I'm sure you will agree with me that uh, many companies, we move many products or information from a person to person. They all simply touch that. They are on, maybe only reviewing it are only inspecting it. They are not making any changes to the product. So if it does not make any changes to the product, it does not fulfill this criteria. So this is the criteria for a value add. So any, if it does not fulfill this criteria, then obviously it would fall under non-value add. And then we have some differences between these and these. 
Now, just like previous slide, uh, based on uh, research, I want to test you once again. I have another water cooler with me. Let's see who grabs it. So I give you six numbers again, uh, starting from 5% to 95%. And the question is, uh, based on, again, uh, wherever we work, whatever industry that is, uh, whatever role we have, depending on the definition of value add, what do we think that currently, what percentage of our total time we are spending on value-added activity in a day? Or let's say generalize it in, in a month. Again, the question is based on our current work, what do we think that what percentage of our total working time we are spending on value added activities? Take a guess, 20%. 20%, okay. Any other input, please? 50%. 50%. My guess is 50%. Sorry? My guess is 50%. 50%, okay. You see, I understand the answer would vary because it depends on uh, what exactly we are doing currently. For example, if I'm part of a planning team, then my maybe 90% time is being spent on value-added activities because I'm planning something, I'm thinking ahead, correct? But if I'm, let's say, a part of a tax board, my 100% time would be non value added because if everything is going smooth, no issues, no one would call me. So I'll be sitting idle. But these numbers are based on, let's say, once we roll up all these individuals' time, a team's time to overall an organization. And interestingly, interestingly, this is the result. A typical organization, it spends more than 95% of his total time on non-value added activities. Means something which was not done right yesterday, now we are spending time and we are fixing it. So these are the two, let's say, effects which we get if we do not know how inputs are being processed into the outputs. <clears throat> So why these effects? So what is lacking? Uh, I'm talking about those organizations who are unable to improve so far. So what is lacking? If we Google this topic, really you will find a long list of the reasons why organization they are uh, unable to optimize or unable to transform. Uh, what I'll cover today is only three men, and those three are not based on Google, those three are based on my personal experience. It may differ with uh, Google's list. <clears throat> so first one is you know, lack of system thinking. Uh, I'll uh, quote here uh, Dr. Akoff. Uh, this is how he explains uh, system thinking. Uh, he says, you count the total number of vehicles we have globally, and we may come up with the number, I'm talking about the type, not the number. We may come up with 1,000 or 2,000 or 1,500. Then he says, okay, bring each one of those, means one from each type, to a big warehouse or a big ground. And then uh, invite best, uh, automobile engineers uh, globally. Uh, once you have them, then give them uh, two tasks. The first task is to list down the major component of an automobile, it means uh, what are the main components that would make an automobile? So this may be their answer. I'm talking about those engineers that uh, we need an engine, we need interior cooling system, exterior, some electrical system, suspension system, and so on. Uh, once we have identified the major component of an automobile, then the next question we need to ask those engineers would be that, okay, now identify out of these 1500 vehicles, which vehicle has best engine? Uh, which one has best braking system and best exhaust system and so on. 
So engineer would go around, they would do their study, they will uh, come up with a list that, okay, yes, engine, best engine belongs to this mate. A best electrical system belongs to this automobile. Now, what we need to ask those engineers is that, okay, remove these best parts from these vehicles and assemble the best possible car. Guess what? What will be the result? If we really disassemble, if we take out the best electric system from one car, best engine out of those 1500 vehicle from another car, and then the ask is, okay, now use these best parts, which are best on their own, and give us the best possible vehicle. Which can we get a vehicle? It can't be done. Sorry? Earlier. It can't be done. Is this it cannot be done. Yes. We, yeah. we will not get a vehicle. Though those parts on their own are the best, best in class. But they want fit. They want work together. So that's what system thinking is, that once we are looking at organization, we are looking at so many moving parts. We are looking at departments, teams, and people. What we need is the best possible product. What we don't want is that just the sum of those individual parts. That's the biggest mistake which companies they make. Uh, for example, a company may have uh, four or five main departments. Each department is being headed by a VP. Now, depending on a VP, one likes these kind of methodologies. He may hire one expert and they will start improving their own line of business or their own department. But they don't understand that uh, how their department is interacting with other departments. And whatever improvements they are making, they, it may not help organization as a whole to improve. So this is also known as a holistic view or end-to-end -end process mapping or process thinking. So same uh, system thinking is not a motor slash engine that takes us from point A to B, but, but the automobile. So that's how he explains uh, the system thinking. Because if you look at the motor or engine, uh, there is no way it can move on its own even from place A to point, point, place B. What to talk about taking passengers from point A to point B. It needs help of tire, it needs interior, it needs a steering wheel, it needs so many other things. Uh, same in today's lecture, it's not the Zoom that's making this presentation possible, but the machines we have logged in these machines zoom there's no way it can help us to really uh, make this present presentation possible uh, it's not our hands that write but it but we who write dr akoff said that okay if you want to test it just cut off your hand and see what it does <laughs> it won't even move so it's uh, not our eyes that see, but we. Same way, it's not one individual who implements a change, but it takes a village to implement a change. Uh, what's system thinking? What is not system thinking that expecting on time, if I, for example, take an example of an airline who wants to, that wants to improve. Expecting on-time takeoff without streamlining luggage management system would not work. Uh, at individual level, expecting a great performance of vehicle during snowy conditions, uh, once we have installed expensive winter tires, won't work if we have issues with our brakes. Uh, another one, demanding governments knew how to improve quickly without changing the mindset of implementation team would not work. That is what is system thinking. And that is what most of the organization are lacking today. Uh, the second uh, point is lack of voice of customer slash value proposition. Uh, it has two parts, 2A, and I'll discuss on the next slide, 2B. As I was mentioning earlier, uh, most of us, uh, 
are familiar with uh, project management uh, in IT world. And we do know the effects of if we miss customers' requirements. Uh, if we have not captured those well, uh, we start, uh, let's say, developing uh, an app or a website. Uh, we know how many change requests we'll get. Uh, I conducted a study at a major IT company in Canada, and uh, we found out that we have on average 26 change requests per project. And we, we know how much time we invest in those change requests and how much delay we usually get in those projects. So same applies to companies, uh, irrespective of whatever product they are delivering, that if they don't know what their customer wants, uh, they cannot improve. So this has two parts. One is, uh, first one is understanding customer requirements. And the second part is once we've understood customer's requirement, how those requirements should be fulfilled. Uh, the process of understanding customer requirements in our world is known as uh, voice of customer. So this is the process. Uh, we identify our customers first. Now here is the challenge. Most of the company, they think that uh, the only customer they have is the external customer. Uh, they totally forget about the internal customer they have, which they serve on a daily basis. So they miss more than 80% of customer because they are ignoring internal customer and they focus only on external customer. That's also the one of the reason uh, they don't know exactly what are the requirements because their requirements are based on only 20% of customer. So we identify all customers, uh, then uh, we really go through the list that what do we need to ask them? How should we interview them? Uh, it should be face-to-face -face in a focus group, through survey or whatever those techniques are available. We'll pick the right technique. Uh, then we will uh, collect customers' feedback. And once we collect, uh, it is not in a particular form. We may be discussing about the quality of uh, a product, but customer may be providing us uh, uh, what he doesn't like about his, let's say, teenage children or about his bosses or about, his, about the weather. So we capture everything, but then we refine it based on our requirement. <clears throat> Once we have refined it, whatever we captured, then we give it a value added understanding means we affinitize it. We come up with different types. So this relates to, let's say, technology. This is process related. This is human related. This is uh, test related and so on. Uh, once that has been affinitized, uh, we will add relative importance uh, to whatever we have captured. Uh, what does relative importance mean that Whatever points we have captured, we'll go back to customer and ask them, okay, is this point more important than this? So pick those uh, priorities. For example, is for a passenger traveling from a point A to point B through an airline, we can ask them, okay, is online arrival important than an entertainment system or otherwise. So what's the relative importance? So we'll have that relative importance. Based on uh, relative importance, we will convert that into CTQ, another term used uh, in this word, known as uh, critical to quality. Uh, based on this, uh, in case of an airline, uh, we will convert it into a deliverable known as, let's say, on-time arrival. That if we have on-time arrival, we know our customer would be happy. Or if we have operational entertainment system installed uh, in the planes, uh, we know customer would be happy. So that is two-way means the first part, how, how to understand uh, a customer requirement and convert those into measurable deliverables, what needs to be delivered. Uh, once we know what needs to be delivered, then we move forward and we follow a four-stage process. Uh, first one, 
uh, business outcome, which is coming from the previous slide that uh, what is required, uh, what do we need to deliver? So that can be desired or perceived. Uh, so whatever we need to deliver, we need to then see that how will we deliver it? What actions do we need to take? What process do we need? Uh, we'll develop that process, then uh, which kind of capabilities we need, who are our stakeholders, what challenges we may face. Uh, once we have figured all those things, then we will go into this target state and roadmap and we will start executing. Execution can be based on quick wins uh, plus based on the plan we'll come up with. And once we are done with this, then we make this whole thing as a business as a whole and we put some controls in place and we also have a governance model that if something really goes uh, away from whatever we need uh, how it should be handled so these are the two parts that how are most of the organization they are unable to understand customers requirement that's the first and based on customer's requirement, even if they know what customer need, how those should be delivered. So that is what is done in this value proposition. Uh, the third point I want to discuss is about lack of building on ideas. <clears throat> uh, we all understand that uh, employees is the uh, biggest asset any company has. And the companies who really don't look after their employees or who do not invite uh, ideas, improvement ideas from their side, they don't improve. Uh, just to illustrate you this concept, let's say this is the uh, start and end of uh, our product. And we have uh, these different colors donate different departments. So we have one, two, three, four or five departments involved to deliver this product. What companies do uh, most of the time as these uh, departments are, they work in silos, they are headed by their own, let's say VP or directors, and these departments, they don't talk to other departments, or even they don't know what's going on to the other departments. So whatever improvements they think are required, they make those improvements without consulting other departments. But we can see from this uh, process that if we have improved the end part, we want to make sure that they all work in harmony. So the best way of building an idea is that uh, these all teams or their reps, uh, or the focus groups, they need to get together and discuss about the ideas. So we may figure out that this team has an idea sitting here, another team idea sitting here and so on. So once we know smaller idea, the smaller hunches sitting all around this process, and once they are discussed collectively, then they build on each other and that results into, into a greater idea. So that's what these organizations are lacking based on my experience so far. So now I want to show you an example that, okay, if we get rid of these points, uh, what is the right way of going after a transformation or improvement? Uh, we followed a three stage process. Uh, the first stage is we need to identify value. Uh, what exactly value means, I've already discussed on, uh, this slide once we were discussing about value proposition. So value means something from customer point of view, whatever they need. So that may have already been part of uh, organization strategy, or it may have been shown as some kind of major challenge. Based on that, we'll come up with a statement that, okay, uh, value we have is to, for example, reduce cost of this product or this service by 10% by this date. If I pick an airline, uh, this value can be, okay, reduce uh, or increase on-time departure of flights from this point to this point by 10% by this date. 
So that would be the value, which is uh, really linked to the strategy. Uh, once we know the value, we'll uh, dig deeper into it. And we'll identify what are the drivers uh, of uh, this deliverable. What all is involved here? So it may be driver one to driver five or driver N. And we'll collect data, we'll assess those drivers. We may come up with that driver three has the biggest opportunity available if we want to improve this. We'll mark driver three, then we will move to stage three, which is to assess this in detail and then apply different techniques and improve and optimize it. Uh, so this driver now would be broken down into its sub-activities uh, from start to end. Let's say, if you go back to a line example, if this driver was uh, a check-in system. So starting from the moment a passenger enters into the airport until he or she boards the plane, all the activities would be listed here. And we will see how long each takes, how many type of errors do we have, and whatever data is available. So to assess these, uh, we will use, as I mentioned earlier, out of the methodology shown in, uh, I think, second or third, uh, third slide, uh, we'll apply various tools, and we will assess these to identify the opportunity we have in, these, uh, in this process. Uh, this assessment may result that, okay, the major opportunity is sitting here, that if we rationalize, let's say, vendors we use for such and such things by 50%. So currently we have, let's say, 10 vendors uh, providing us these kind of services. If we rationalize those to five by this, we can save this much. If we save this much here, that's the value. It means we will be saving here. If we save here, it, would, it means we are saving here. Once we are saving here, it means we are executing whatever strategy we have. So that is how things are done. Another illustration, uh, my favorite a black box. Uh, we know that uh, these are the, let's say if this is an organization, it's not that organization has only one product one organization may have 20 or 100 products. So whatever goes out of organization, we list on this side. So four different colors, uh, they are showing that we have four different products. So to produce these products, obviously we need some kind of input. So this is the basic rule. Uh, what we do, we pick each one of these products and we map it end to end. It means starting from once we receive customer's request until we have delivered the product to our customer. We will list the whole process. Then based on the methodology, we'll analyze. Uh, once we have captured the data, we'll assess it, analyze it. Analysis may give us some opportunities uh, either here, here, or here. So we'll mark those those stages and then we will drill down into those stages uh, even the sub steps of these stages <clears throat> that is known as assess and optimize so assess and optimize is done with the help of uh, subject matter expert we have who work plus practitioner let's say in business transformation field at the same time, uh, if we want to improve organization's performance, we not only want to solve a problem, but we want to dissolve a problem. Hence, we want to really build a culture that is self-sufficient once it comes to business transformation. Uh, it should not be dependent on few, few experts. It should be everyone's job. Hence, we focus on culture change. Uh, that means we train uh, all levels of organization. And there are different uh, certification level in this field, which we award them. 
So what's the outcome? Uh, if we follow these, uh, uh, let's say, recommendation, what can be the outcome of a company? Uh, again, I'll cover only two uh, main components, uh, which uh, matters most to a customer. One is uh, outcome and quality. Uh, this is the state once we start working any optimization project means. Uh, the goal of the customer was that uh, company needs to uh, hit this bullseye, but uh, what's the company's performance is scattered all around. So this is usually the state given to us that please come and help us uh, fix this. So to fix it, as you mentioned earlier, we will apply the right tool and we want to move it from this shape, this performance to this performance. So as customer wants that everything should hit bull's eye, but it was not. So we'll try to move everything right into the center by applying different techniques and methods. Uh, sometimes it's easy to move uh, from this stage to this. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes once we make those changes, we may have these all centered into another place, but yet we have not hit the bullseye. So once we have found this center, then we'll find another way to move it to the center. So it means overall our quality would improve because whatever we are delivering now, it is focused on based on whatever customer needs. We have understood it, hence we are able to deliver it. And we have a mechanism in place as well that tracks and monitor this performance. Uh, the other outcome or the benefit we get is on the timeline. <clears throat> uh, let me explain that concept this way. Let's say this is a process, means these are the different uh, activities or steps we take, one, two, three, four, and A, B, C. Uh, here A, B, C, D, E means that these are non-value added activities and one, two, three, four, five means value added. Again, uh, we have to go back to the slide where we discussed about value add and non-value add. Uh, in nutshell, these all are activities we take to deliver some kind of an output. But once we apply the definition of value add and non-value add, we figure out for this example, that A, B, C, D, E are non-value add and one, two, three, four, five are value add. So as these are non-value add means they are waste, what does that mean? That means that even if we do not complete these activities, we will not have any effect on the product because product would be delivered anyway if we take one, two, three, four, or four, these five activities. So now the first goal for us is to get rid of these non-value added activities. That should be the ideal so that we can save all of this time. Zal, uh, can I interrupt here, please? Please. Salman, can you give me an example of what a non-value add uh, process uh, 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 activity would be when you talk in, in the example you gave for the airline departures uh, in time? Give me a non-value added activity in that process, an example. Thank you. Uh, let's say we, we are missing, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, let's say if we are missing on time departure, and we want to figure out the reason and we listed what all activities were part of this process. We found out that we waited 30 minutes for a refueler. So that 30 minutes may be somewhere here. It did not add any value to overall process. Another one, let's say uh, for same. All right, uh, good, good, thank you. Good. We good missed on-time departure. And the pilot announced that, yes, we have one passenger who did not show up. So we now need to remove that passenger's luggage from the plane. So they took 45 minutes to locate his luggage. 
if they have an efficient system in place, they can locate that, that luggage within five minutes. So that is a definition of non-value. Did I answer your question, sir? Yes, indeed, you did. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so based on the definition, uh, we'll label these activities. And then the first task for us, the ideal scenario would be to get rid of all these non-value added, added activities. But most of the time, it's not possible that we can remove those because sometimes these activities, for example, here activity D, it may be enabling activity three and four. If we remove it, then whatever work has been done at three, it cannot be passed on to four. So if we cannot remove it, then we should find ways how we can reduce it. So let's say based on application of various tools, we were able to reduce these non-value added activities from this length to this length. You may have noticed I did not make any changes to value add activities. What does that mean? That if as an operator, I'm taking one hour to complete activity two here, I'm still taking one hour. So optimization or transformation does not mean that we have to work faster. It means we don't have to spend time on those activities that are not adding value. Because if I hasten and I start taking 30 minutes as opposed to one hour, I may be compromising on the quality. Hence, the first task for us is don't make any changes to value add, just focus on the non-value add, which is the base, and try to either eliminate it or reduce it. So coming back to our discussion, what I was saying that, okay, based on application of different tools, uh, we were able to reduce these non-value added activities from this size to this size. So if I rearrange this whole thing now, uh, I was completing, let's say, a product in this timeline earlier. This is starting point and this is end point by reducing non-value added activities or optimizing those activities, now I'm able to produce same product from starting from here until here. And this is the timeline that I have saved. So M and O, P, Q stands for that M is saved from A, N is saved from B, O from C and so on. So still same performance are workers are not working faster. They are still working at the same pace, but whatever wastage we had, we have reduced it. Hence, we saved this. So that is the time we have saved. So what should we do with this timeline now? Uh, there are many options, many companies, they go to the wrong route. And that wrong route is that they would lay off many folks now. If we had 10 people here, and now we know that uh, we can complete that in half of the time. So they will really let 50% workforce go, but that's not the right approach. The right approach is that the time saved should be utilized uh, to generate more. I mean, this is the capacity we have generated. We can now process more. We can produce more. If we produce more, we can earn more. And let's say if demand is constant, then we can utilize this time on a training, a quality training, so that whatever we are delivering here, it should be enhanced, its quality should be enhanced. Most of the time organization, they don't spend time once it comes to root cause analysis because they think they don't have time available. So once we have generated this time, that can be, that can be utilized in root cause analysis or standardization or continuous improvement. And all of these things would really overall uh, would benefit the company as a whole. So now coming back to the main topic, once we have understood that what's lacking, uh, what are the effects, and if 
they do it the right way, what are the benefits? Uh, so what exactly then business transformation mean? Uh, again, if we Google it, uh, really we'll find many definitions. Uh, there are many books written on it. Uh, whatever I'm sharing here, it's based on my understanding, what I've seen, and I'll try to keep it very simple. Uh, business transformation, in my opinion, means that uh, to provide such an environment to organization where technology processes and workforce, uh, they can integrate well, work in, work with, in harmony with each other. Uh, so that they can identify the right change for organization. Uh, please uh, uh, see the focus on the right because we don't simply need a change. We need a right change that is helpful for the company, that is helpful for our environment, helpful for our employees. So this environment should help these three main component to identify a right change. Uh, then execute that change, and most importantly, learn from that change. Once we follow this approach, what companies get at the end is known as, in today's term, organization excellence or organization effectiveness. Gone are those days, once company used to say, we are implementing ISO 9000, or we are implementing Lean, or Six Sigma, or business process engineering. Uh, for many companies, those uh, are those names or terms are not considered good anymore. So they have merged all those. They have picked the appropriate tool from different methodologies. And this is the new buzzword nowadays, organization excellence or organizational effectiveness. <clears throat> So in addition to this, uh, if we, let's say, want to go into the detail of this, that what enables this, uh, we will see that uh, a business transformation would help us uh, improve these three key metric, uh, cost reduction, customer satisfaction, and shortened uh, delivery time. Uh, if we dig deeper into cost reduction, we see it has two supports, uh, cost saving and cost avoidance, this is a word on its own. Uh, if we generate capacity, it would uh, help us uh, save cost. Um, once we focus on reliab reliability enhancement, reliability can be for equipment, it can be even uh, people's performance. Uh, once we have employees growth, reliability enhancement, it also saves uh, cost. Um, once we improve safety, in return, it, you know, we save on cost avoidance. Uh, we increase our employee learning and growth that in return really generate capacity. Uh, once we focus on quality improvement, that results into a shortened delivery time plus customer satisfaction. And all of these overall really results as Shahid was saying earlier that it's always the profit, it's economics this results into increased profit, and that is market competitiveness. Uh, what's the results of all these? Uh, just to give you a sort of conclusion, I have another slide on the conclusion, but the conclusion of uh, this whole discussion, uh, uh, discussion of uh, business transformation, this is how it used to be, old paradigm that performance gained in one area required a trade-off in one or more of the other areas. For example, if a customer's requirement was a shorter delivery time, I'm talking about two, day, two or three decades ago. So what companies used to do, they will say, okay, yes, if you need something quickly, uh, we'll cost you more and uh, quality may not be that great. So that used to be the scenario at that time. But please consider yourself uh, in today's world and uh, think about as a consumer, what do we need from our service provider today? That's the new paradigm. What we need is, uh, we need shorter delivery time. We also need uh, higher possible quality. And plus we don't want to pay more. 
So once we apply these concepts, really this is how those concepts or approaches would help an organization that uh, to come up with the style, to have a working style of an organization that can help them to serve this kind of customer. These, these are the type of new customer now. So once we follow these approaches, these methodology, they really help organization to fulfill requirements of a new customer. So where it further helps, uh, in addition to whatever we discussed, uh, if once we really go deeper into the black box, uh, it helps us examine how we create our own problems. As I mentioned earlier, the goal is not to solve a problem, but to dissolve it. So it should not come again. We should not be firefighting all the time. Um, it helps us recognize the system that system structure influences it, its performance. Uh, our analysis many times uh, really led us to change the structure of organization. That what's the best combination, how these teams should be structured and what should be the reporting mechanism. Uh, it, should, it helps us focusing on value chain from a customer's uh, uh, need point of view. So it further helps us uh, doing the right things versus doing the things right. We all understand the difference between this. Uh, working on the system versus in the system. What does this mean is that most of the time, really we go into the woods, we look for those details which do not matter and we don't look at the system as a whole on the system. We just go into the system and we are lost there. And it focuses on improving processes versus adopting processes. Uh, most of the organization, they adopt processes. Whatever process is given to them, even they will try to have their structure and equipment around that process as opposed to having it based on the process. So the main question now that if companies, they like it and they want to move forward with uh, this approach, what should they do? Uh, again, if we uh, really Google it, uh, we will find a long list that what companies do uh, need to do. Uh, but I'll mention it only the first step. Uh, to optimize, to transform the requirement for a company is to acknowledge that they need a change. And once they have acknowledged that need, then I'll quote here Michael Johnson, uh, the famous uh, athlete. Uh, he had a really awkward style of running as compared to other runners and someone asked him, okay, have you ever thought if you change your style to other runners, uh, you may improve your performance? So that's what he said, that if I ran like all the other runners, I would be back there with them. So once we have identified a change, then companies really need to find new ways of implementing that change. Uh, the conclusion of uh, this uh, short discussion, uh, the world is changing and to keep up with the pace, so does organizations. I guess there's no disagreement on this. Any disagreement on this, please? No, thank you. That's a, that's a <laughs> For organizations, uh, the choice is harsh. Uh, either change or die, correct? No choice. We have seen many organizations who uh, fail to change what happened to them. But how will the process improvement function change with changes in the technologies coming like AI, IoT, uh, uh, 5G and uh, all digitization coming in? How would this function of uh, quality assurance or process uh, uh, improvement change? It's a very big question. I'm so sorry. I uh, must appreciate your um, great effort on educating us. Uh, and this question is a really heavy question. So, but since you're the expert, I would like to a little bit learn from you, maybe in the simple terms. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Uh, 
I, I tried to cover this on the slide where I was discussing what is business uh, transformation. That is a combination of mainly three things, uh, technology, people, and uh, processes. Uh, once I deliver these uh, sessions to IT folks, most of them, they're not happy with me because uh, <laughs> I usually tell them that how IT helps an organization is that it expedites things. Did you get my point? So once we have latest technology, how it helps us, it would expedite things. Yes. So I'll quote Bill Gates here. Uh, he says, uh, let me recall uh, his uh, statement. Uh, I think he says there are two rules in transformation that, uh, 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 just give me a second, please. Let me recall. Mm -hmm. Yes, transformation applied to an efficient process would magnify efficiencies. And transformation applied to an inefficient process would magnify inefficiency. So yes, we have uh, latest technology available, but if that is not synced into the processes, there is no way companies can improve. If processes are producing errors and we optimize it, our error rate would magnify. So before we can automate, before we can apply new technology, we have to go back and look at the processes. Yes. Do we have the right processes? Now, the third question comes up, where does people fit in? May I, may I just add a little bit? I'm so sorry. Uh, yes. Like, like artificial intelligence is a, is a, uh, is a very good uh, function that is coming up. So if we, we have to train the models of machine language, and if we do not have the correct data uh, to train the models, we will not have right results if we apply those models. Correct. So unfortunately, I think that uh, synchronizes with your response that we need to have uh, a good, good accuracy of uh, data collected and then we are able to train the model. Uh, uh, what I've seen in the manufacturing industry is that the data recorded is not good. Uh, some people is uh, some people are recording in a different way. Some people, as you said, they're different functions. They have they work in silos, so they have their own kind of uh, uh, inaccuracies inbuilt in the processes. So that's a big challenge, I believe, to uh, apply uh, artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is being applied to reduce the time, but the data available is 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 not very really accurate. So, uh, so I think it will take a little longer time to get that data and then, you know, maybe. Thank you, sir. I think uh, that's correct. Even I can share my experience that uh, whatever we have imp to improve, the first thing we look for is data. Yes. Uh, most of the companies, they don't have it. Even if they have it, the one thing they, all of them tell us is that, okay, we don't trust it. Yes. Uh, why? Because they were following some system. They have to put some inserts into it. They have to key in data they are keying in, but knowingly it's not right. True. So this famous slang that garbage in, garbage out. So if we are using uh, the data which is not trusted, we cannot take decisions on its analysis. Yes. That's another reason why most of the projects companies they complete and they are failure because those projects were initiated on wrong data. Yes. Analysis of wrong data. Mm, that's a good uh, another reason why company then don't follow this route which we are discussing here, as they do not have data, mm. plus we do need data to come up with the right conclusion or right analysis, it means we have to spend some time first to collect that data let's say three months or four months. Yes. Companies are so impatient that they don't want to assign that kind of time to us. Hence, if they cannot assign time, we do not have data, we do not have right analysis, means we cannot identify the right opportunity, hence no improvements. True. And if we work on the wrong data, wrong improvements. Yes. So going back that yes, technology would help us 
provided we apply that technology on the right process, on the right date. Yes, and that's a big challenge in yeah. fact at this time. Thank you. So it's people who change. So we're talking about organization that their choice is harsh. Either they have to change or they would die. So, but at the same time, we know it's people who change, not organization. So that means we need to invest in people. We need to change the culture of organization. Once people are changed, teams are changed, departments are changed, organization will change. Uh, the old order, which was uh, bosses boss and workers work, uh, no longer exist. What worked only yesterday may not work today or tomorrow. And playing safe has become the riskiest move of all time. A new way of working is emerging. Please be part of it. So I thank you very much, and I'm here to answer any of your questions, please. How do you change the culture, Prasad? Uh, but that's a big problem. That's another big problem. Beside that garbage data, the second big problem is that companies' culture, that's a, that's a, that's a huge problem. You rightly uh, pointed out. So uh, that's the sort of biggest factor. Uh, again, I'll share only my experience because response to this question may be different in books. What I found out that people would be part of the change if they understand the change. If you, let's say we want to move from this process or this way of working to another way of working, it means there was a problem. Only then we want to change it. What companies, most of the companies they do, they don't discuss that problem with their employees. Someone sitting in the boardroom would come up with a solution and then they would push that solution to whole organization. Yes. So employees, once they don't know the issue, they don't know how they can contribute. So what they see is that someone is pushing a solution to them. Hence, they would resist. But on the other side, if you really involve employees and discuss that this is the issue we have, our organization is facing, what do you think how we can solve this? How we can dissolve this? Run a few sessions. And so I, I can tell you that the best solution we get is from the same subject matter expert. It's never a third person. It's never those best solutions are never from the boardroom. It's from those subject matter experts. So once they know the problem, they will discuss it and they will come up with the solution. So once you have taken their solution and you've implemented it, they all would be part of that solution. Hence, there's no resistance. This is how culture can be changed. But unfortunately, uh, most of the companies, they don't follow this path. They hire a consultant from outside, considered expert in this field. They will come, they will come up with the solution and that solution is usually pushed on those employees. I challenged, uh, I think, uh, one company in Saudi Aramco last year once they developed a strategy. And then I challenged them, okay, yes, you have developed it. But studies shows 90% strategies, they fail. Organization, they, they don't execute those. Have you considered those measures that how this strategy would be implemented? Yeah. And usually the answer is no, because who develops these strategies? The consultant from outside, who are not part of the organization. They will sit in the boardroom, come up with, this is how organization would do. But the people who have to execute it, they are unfamiliar with what is required from their side. So these are the really few big holes once it comes to the change of the culture. Yeah, and uh, this is probably something in the background that the leadership, they want to hide certain things from the employees. <laughs> they don't want to. Yeah, again, many reasons, sir. Yes, it can be any reason. Either they don't yeah. consider them that they are capable of. Yes. Yeah, uh, there, can be, there are many reasons. Yes, there could be many reasons, you're right. But, uh, uh, and, and organizational and mindset change, uh, leadership has to act as the role model, in fact. So they, they, since they do not understand, like your black box, which you showed, they do not understand the organization. So uh, they, they cannot act as a role model because they're not clear what they have to explain to the employees. So that kind of... Uh, vagueness and uh, 
unclear uh, uh, mindset of the leadership uh, that that is another hindrance that they are unable to explain the change to the employees okay. and employees want to see the clarity and when leadership does not have the clarity so that's probably a gap uh, true sir so, so it's very simple that to suggest a change not easy one needs to do his or her homework first yes one needs to compare things that which method is better in this scenario one needs to test those and these executives they don't do that so if they don't know what's going on how they can suggest some improvements yes that's a, that's a big the only people who can suggest improvements are people who are working on those processes who know how things are done and the irony is most of the organization they don't engage those folks so thank you very much um, great commitment well, different so any other question please ifzal uh, i wanted to thank you for a extremely informative uh, discourse on business transformation although we all understand a little bit only but um, thank you very much it was thank you. Uh, remnants of uh, your expertise in the field and uh, from on behalf of uh, every one of us listening today and who will watch this on the youtube tomorrow onwards we, we i thank you for your effort and i think you should prepare the next uh, part of uh, this uh, topic which you hinted at and sir. it will again benefit all of us uh, in one way or another Thank you, Zal. My pleasure, sir. God bless you. Thanks for attending, sir. Thank you, Zal, for your time. Really appreciate. It. Thanks a lot. Thank Then, Zal, I have one question. Please, sir. <laughs> uh, you talked about the, uh, in between the personal reliability also. Per personal performance or competency? Oh, yeah. Yes, performance. competency it also then uh, that uh, constitute how much reliable a person how one can measure the personal reliability whereas the i think personal attributes are uh, qualitative not quantitative how you can say the personal reliability on some uh, very strategic uh, related assignments thank you sir so it can be both qualitative and quantitative uh, it depends on the type of work organization is engaged if uh, people are being judged on the productivity then it could be uh, quantitative but if people are judged on the quality it would be qualitative uh, what we do is sir we see that okay to deliver this product uh, which kind of expertise do we need uh, many specialized tasks may require some kind of certifications uh some kind of testing experience then depending on uh, who is working there which kind of skills that person already has we identify those gaps and then we come up with the development plan and then we monitor that person that how many errors they made and uh, what's the productivity that's how companies they measure their people sir yes in manufacturing uh, setup you might say but uh, i use the word in strategic setups where reliability of a person and the sometimes in the state secrets are very important where are those attributes like person could be uh, trustworthy but how you could measure that somebody is seven trustworthy or five trustworthy or what are the measurable so i think organization they want measure these kind of uh, measures really uh, if someone is trustworthy what the metric they have is uh, productivity and quality once it comes to the skill level of organization we are not really measuring the honesty level integrity level or behavioral things at the once we roll up all of these things what companies need to see is that how much one has produced and how many errors so their whole calculation is based on those two metric once it comes to the indiv individuals yes what i said what you are talking about in a manufacturing setup or in a product where it is where i says sometimes we are some strategic decision making and uh strategic work is going on so i can you uh, need 
Yes, sir. Let, let's say if we discuss a project manager, there's no product uh, involved here. But at the end of the project, if I have to evaluate that project manager, I would see, okay, how far he delivered from initial schedule or initial budget or how many change requests we had. So if we had a lot of change requests in that project, then the skill level to me uh, is not up to the mark because project manager should have ensured at the start that we have captured everything that is required. But this trade so sector quantifiable now, like at the end of the day, the net result here was a quantifiable deliverables, objective. So, yeah, they already go, they always go after the deliverables. Yes. So Dr. Deming Kathan, if something cannot be measured, it cannot be improved. <laughs> So that's what my question is. If I am saying in a strategic setup, if we want to evaluate a personal reliability, where things, let's say, of state secrets are there, and you just uh, can't rely on a person, uh, so you don't. While selecting the people, you can't trust on such people. Correct. Right, so there is one simple check that okay, was he supposed to do this? Answer is no, he was not supposed to do this. Has he done it? Yes. So it means it's not reliable. But uh, it would cost. Sir, they can have the bandha honest or they're dishonest or they're both a see the secret check. But that's the trade. We are discussing here, sir, skills. We are discussing here, sir, skills, not trades. <laughs> Ultimately, we have to end result. We have to end deliverable. We have to end delivery. We have to end delivery. वो जो डिलीवरेबल है उसी के सारा फिर वैल्यूएट होगा हां वो सारी चीजें फिर पाइपलाइन में आ जाती हैं बाद ऑफ फोर्स द बर्चेट भी हो जाती है यस टू दे डू चल ठीक ओके जाल थैंक यू वेरी मच सर यू वेलकम सर थैंक यू रियली अप्रिशिएट योर टाइम एफर्ट्स वेरी इंटरैक्टिव सेशन माय प्रेयर सर थैंक यू थैंक्स अफजल ऑल द बेस्ट थैंक यू सर